TSC reporter Richie Sloan is here on site with us too. How's it going, Richie? Great guys, this place is amazing, and I'm here to give you the inside scoop on what it has to offer. That's why we pay you the big bucks. Take it away, Richie. On Friday, February 1st, 2008, the city of Lakeland broke ground with hopes of one day building a park where kids of all ages could play, regardless of mental or physical disabilities. So our first thing was to do a needs assessment, and we found out that we had over 17,000 children just in Polk County that had needs that were not being met by our playgrounds in Lakeland. Using Barnett Park as inspiration, engineers quickly went to work. The Butterfly Foundation of Lakeland, or the Kaleidoscope Project, paid more than half of the park's cost to build. We had a huge chunk that we needed to raise, so we decided to do a public art project, what was called Kaleidoscope Butterflies in Flight. And we got local businesses to contribute and sponsor butterflies, and we had 87 butterflies that we placed all around town that were decorated by various artists, and that project raised $585,000 for the project. The other half came from grant programs, rotary clubs, and other government organizations. On January 16, 2009, Common Ground opened its doors to the public. Some of the play areas include Adventure Canyon, Webb Peak, Butterfly Meadow, Fossil Beach, and Journey Plateau. He has a club foot. Uh, he's had two surgeries on it. He's, he has special needs, but he uh, can play around good here. Very not, accessible for him. Right, accessible. It's like for like fun, like after school. Like we do it on the weekends when I'm not feeling bad and stuff. It's interesting, the reactions that we have received haven't just been local reactions. We've gotten comments and press from all over the country. We were just recognized in a huge 10-page spread in a magazine called Landscape Architecture Magazine. Hey, you want to come to an amazing park? It's called Common Ground Park. I love it. Me and my mom go there almost every Sunday and Saturday, and it's really cool. You want to come? It's great to see that what started out as a vision has turned into such an amazing success. The park is open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. From Common Ground, this is Richie Sloan reporting for TSC News. Cancer, the C word. Every year our country loses over half a million people to this deadly disease. Cancer is abnormal cells that grow out of control and eventually cause a tumor. Cancer can be caused by heredity, exposure to cancer-causing substances, or poor health choices. Young teens account for 2% of all cancer cases. Since it's more common in adults, teens are more likely to know a family member or someone in a friend's family who has cancer. While some can be treated or controlled, cancer is still the leading cause of death for people under the age of 85. And here's an even more frightening statistic. In the United States, one in every four people die from cancer. Scary statistics aside, what cancer really does is change people's lives forever. Vicki Howell was 19 years old when she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Her family stood bravely at her side fighting the battle with her. She complained of headaches for two days and um, on the second day we took her to the hospital. You know, took her to, um, to get an MRI done and they saw the tumor. And that was on the 12th of September and on the 14th of September, two days later, um, she was having brain surgery. When she had her second recurrence, they gave her more chemotherapy. And then in uh, last year, in 2009, um, it recurred again. We went to Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, and she had another operation there to remove it. Vicki lost her battle with brain cancer on December 9, 2009. She was 22 years old. When she got it, first thing I wanted to say was, why? You know? And then you say, why not somebody else? And then you say, that's, that's wrong. You don't want this for anybody. Cancer has steadily made its way through the women of the Jones family. Finding strength in each other, they battled lymphoma and breast cancer. My family history with cancer started with my paternal grandmother. She developed breast cancer at age 35. And uh, that was many years ago. And at age 35, she had a mastectomy and the next form of cancer came with my mom. She had just retired from her job and she developed lymphoma cancer and was actually um, on life support with less than a 10% chance of surviving. And she uh, 
Uh, her physician at the time came across an experimental drug that uh, took effect in her body immediately, and uh, she is now walking around today like you and I are. Uh, several years after her battle with lymphoma cancer, she was also diagnosed with breast cancer. Several years after that, that I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, my sister Kelly uh, was just diagnosed a year and a half ago with breast cancer as well. I always kind of had in the back of my head, am I next, am I next? So when I got diagnosed, I didn't cry, I wasn't shocked, I just handled it very matter of fact. What do I need to do? Let's get going, let's get it taken care of, and, and I went from there. New treatments in cancer offer hope to those who must face the disease. The Center for Cancer Care and Research in North Lakeland customizes their treatment plans to fit the individual needs of the patient. Nurse Don Watson explains the future of cancer treatment. There are over 150 new drugs for cancer treatment. Uh, and they vary from oral pills, um, some of them are injections, and then some of them are also IV. But the new thing and the neatest thing about the chemotherapy that's coming out now is it's called targeted therapy. And so it actually targets your body to make your immune cells fight off the cancer. If we all pitch in and help raise money for cancer research, we can change the C word from cancer to cure. Amanda Olander, TSC News. Hopefully, authorities will catch up with this dangerous criminal soon. Yes, I've done it. I've taken over the airwaves. Do you hear me out there? It's me, Mini-Me. And I'm at Downtown Lakeland at the Coliseum of Comics. I'm here to research other comic book characters, and I plan to take over the world. Did you know comic books have been around since the 1800s? But it wasn't until the 1900s that the terms comics and comic strips came into common use in the United States. Early American comic books were often collections of reprints of newspaper comic strips. The first issue of Detective Comics was released by the company that eventually becomes DC Comics in 1937. A year later, Action Comics made its debut with the first superhero ever, Superman. The character was a hit and paved the way for many more superhero comic book characters, such as Spider-Man, the Hulk, and the Green Lantern. In 2009, the Walt Disney Company bought Marvel Entertainment and its comics for $4 billion. My favorite thing about collecting comic books is uh, definitely the, the escapism of it all, um, going to different worlds, seeing different powers that uh, different characters have. Um, and for me, it's just definitely a fun way to get away from reality for, uh, for an hour or two while I'm reading my books. My favorite thing about collecting comics, I guess, is uh, my dad purchased a comic book for me so that he could help me start reading as like a learning tool. But uh, as I got older, I really only collect them as an investment opportunity. My favorite comic book character is Superman because he has super strength. Fantastic Four because their comics are more interesting. My favorite comic book character would be Nicholas Fury because um, he fought alongside Captain America in World War II. Buying comic books as an investment is a newer idea to the comic book world. The first comics were either read and tossed or shared among friends. The most valuable comics are usually the rarest, or comics that feature uh, first appearances, like the first appearance of Batman, Superman, Spider-Man. Those are usually the comics that are worth the most money. With the release of comic book characters into pop culture through movies and television, there was quite a rise in the value of those classic comic books. Over time, some of those comic books, especially first issues, can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Such as Action Comics number 1 which is now worth about half a million dollars. Jessica Gray, I mean, mini me, TSC News. Recently, Mrs. Horn's eighth grade critical thinking class learned about genes and chromosomes. The class talked about what dominant and recessive genes are and about which genes make each person unique. This project included LGMS's signature critical thinking lesson how to be bully free. Each student brought in a pair of blue jeans and decorated them according to what makes them special. I decided to do this project because here at Lake Gibson Middle School we've done a lot of anti-bullying activities and um, we had the dean to come in and talk to the students about not um, bullying other students and how to identify bullying and it occurred to me this project called Respect My Designer Genes. So we talk about genes as in your genetic structure, the chromosomes, as well as 
blue jeans. So what I thought would be a really cool idea is for the kids to kind of really get to thinking about the different things about themselves, what they like, kind of what really makes them who they are, as well as have some really good statements about anti-bullying on their blue jeans. I guess my favorite thing about the project is just that the kids did such a great job. Everyone just put like 100% into this project. They were really excited. They brought in blue jeans. I had one student who brought in like four or five pairs of blue jeans. So um, I, I, I think it was really great because I think the kids really understood what the project was all about. And um, they respected the project and they respected each other and they just did a really great job. So I think that's what I like the best. I enjoyed this project because it gave me a chance to learn more about my friends and I enjoyed working with the paint. I enjoyed this project because I got to play with paint and paint my pants and hang out with friends. I enjoyed that it's artistic and all, you can do what you want, but you got to make it like about bully free. I enjoyed it because we got to design our jeans and make stuff about us. I enjoy this project because we got to decorate our jeans and have fun. Thanks to Mrs. Horn's fifth period critical thinking class for allowing us to take a look inside their Respect My Designer Jeans project. Amanda Olander, TSC News. Every year, you and your family get the flu vaccines to keep everyone in your household safe. But what about Fido, Fluffy, and Rex? Yes, dogs can get the flu too. Canine influenza, or dog flu, is a contagious respiratory disease that includes symptoms such as coughing, runny nose, loss of appetite, and fever. But in some dogs, canine influenza can be very serious. With infected dogs developing pneumonia, labored breathing, and even bleeding into the lungs. This disease is widespread and documented in 30 states. And yes, Florida is one of them. There is a vaccine for the dog flu available. The vaccine will not treat the disease and may not prevent it entirely, but it will help decrease the severity of the disease if your dog catches it. Veterinarian Dr. Nola Gideon was a guest at our Great American Teach-In and spoke to us about the vaccine. It's quite safe. We've not had any reactions to it. It is a, what's called a killed vaccine, which makes it very safe. And it's given in two injections initially. We give the first and then give a second one two to four weeks later, and then they are protected for a year. And after that, they get a yearly booster. To keep your beloved dog safe, talk with your veterinarian to see if the dog flu vaccine is right for your pet. And if your dog hasn't had the vaccine, then watch for coughing, sneezing, loss of appetite, or depression. And any of these signs should warrant you to go see a vet to make sure that your dog doesn't have pneumonia. Fido, Fluffy, and Rex will appreciate everything you've done for them. Shannon Mulder, TSC News. When you think about recycling, you probably picture this small yellow box you put all your plastic and glass bottles into. But have you ever thought about recycling foam lunch trays, expanded polystyrene, or EPS, commonly referred to as styrofoam? It's a puffy, bulky material that is not suitable for regular recycling. RecycleTech here in Lakeland has been recycling EPS since 2004 when its recycling plant was opened. RecycleTech offers a line of equipment that can recycle all volumes of EPS waste efficiently and safely. Well, when we get the styrofoam here at the plant, it goes into our machines and um, essentially the machine takes the styrofoam and crushes it down. It breaks it apart into smaller pieces. Uh, and those small pieces drop through a screen and into a screw auger that turns and compresses those small pieces of styrofoam. And as it turns, it's pushing it out the side of the machine. And right as it gets to the end, there are several heating bands and it melts the styrofoam because the styrofoam is primarily air. So that warm, melted styrofoam is being extruded out the side of the machine. It hardens. It cools down and hardens. And that's called styrene. But one problem seems to emerge. RecycleTech cannot recycle our lunch trays when there's moisture and food particles left on them. It's a difficult issue and there are a lot of schools that, that have that same question and are dealing with that problem today. I think you need to be conscious of it and you can collect the styrofoam instead of um, throwing it in a, a black plastic bag and bringing it out to the curb. You can maybe create a collection point in the school and um, get the styrofoam over to us or to the county and they'll bring it to us. Uh, that would be a real good start. RecycleTech is busy making improvements to their facility so in the future they can recycle school lunch trays. 
For now, this Lakeland business will continue recycling and searching for new and more effective ways to recycle EPS. Amanda Olander, TSC News. In the past, Lake Evans offered a variety of different sport clubs. Basketball, football, and bowling were all sports that were offered here at one time or another. This year, speech teacher Ms. Lawson offers the students a different kind of sport, jumping rope. I felt it was important to start the jump rope club because four out of five kids don't get enough exercise, and I love to jump rope. Um, I've been jumping in the Jump for Heart back in high school and elementary school, so I kind of thought it would be something fun to do here at LG. You have to keep up with it, and it's a fun sport. I like it. I like jumping rope. Boxers jump rope. A lot of athletic people jump rope. So I decided, why not I join? So I joined. I joined the jump rope club because it's very active and it's healthy for your body. I hope that they learn to work together and teach others their little fun tricks that they do. And I also hope that they take away the health and want to keep working out, jumping rope, running, um, any kind of exercise that they can take with them. If you would like to join the fun, the jump rope club meets every Wednesday in Portable C. Grant Bell, reporting for TSZ News. Have you ever told a girl that she couldn't play football? Or that it was against the rules for her to play hockey? Well, truth is, many girls are stepping up to the plate by playing football, baseball, and basketball. In fact, the number of girls playing sports has risen 33% over the last two years. After many years of girls being banned from playing sports with the guys, many sports have come up with leagues just for the girls. What sports do you play and why do you play them? I skateboard. I do it because I think it's fun. I play soccer because it's a very aggressive sport and it lists down stress. I like playing football because I like to um, tackle people and I like to be the quarterback. I play soccer because you can kick the ball. I play football because that's how I like to spend my time. Soccer because it's fun to play. I like basketball because my brother and my dad got me interested in it. Girls don't always have to be on the sidelines as a cheerleader. They can be in the game as well. Remember this saying, girls can do what guys can do, only better. And in heels. Jessica Gray, TSC News. Hot. Social networking sites such as MySpace, Facebook, and Twitter have really taken off over the past few years. Friends and families can share photos and send jokes and talk about what's going on in their lives. But controversy can arrive with these sites. Families can talk about their personal lives, but should teachers and students? No, I do not believe students should be allowed to be friends with teachers on social networking sites. I think it's inappropriate and creepy when they try and find you or anybody with your last name. I share enough personal stories that you guys can feel like you're a part of my life. I don't need to be your friend on MySpace or Facebook or any other social networking site. It's creepy. Right, Cheyenne? No. I think teachers and students should be friends. So when that student goes off to high school, she could stay in touch with her favorite teacher. No, I do not believe that teachers and students should be friends on social networking sites because it's flat out inappropriate. And I'm pretty sure they don't need to be friends with someone who is way older than them. And honestly, I don't have time to deal with everything that's wrong with a middle schooler's life to be their friend. I can't even handle my own friends, for goodness sakes. It shouldn't happen because we have friends our own age and there's no reason for us to be, to be talking to people about our personal problems older than us. I don't think teachers and students should be friends on social networks because it can end up with problems and when you get back to school, if you have a MySpace, teachers can see what you've posted online and then they can bug you about it in class. No, I don't think teachers and students should be friends because conflicts can arise and then they won't, then they'll be mad at each other at school. That it's okay as long as it's appropriate um, and the teacher has a website that has a purpose. For example, I have a MySpace um, music account um, where I put some science songs on it and I've had students add me before and I accept them because um, they go and they learn science through songs. Um, and I think it's a good way. Um, as long as it's appropriate and there's a purpose to it, I think it's totally acceptable. No, because I don't want them looking at my personal stuff. I do not. I don't even think children should have MySpace accounts until they get minimum high school age. Whether you agree or disagree, social networking sites are becoming more popular day by day and have now taken over as the main form of communication from those far away. Shannon Muldrew, TSC News. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Breast Cancer Awareness Month is commonly associated with the pink ribbon. The idea to use a ribbon to spread the word about breast cancer was first thought of in 1979 by a woman named Charlotte Haley, who gave out peach-colored ribbons to help support her grandmother, daughter, and sister when they developed the disease. 
But in 1991, Evelyn Lauder of the SD Lauder Corporation and Alexandra Penny of Self Magazine were putting together an article in the October edition of Self Magazine about breast cancer called the Breast Cancer Awareness Campaign and heard about the ideas of a ribbon. To remove themselves from legal issues with Charlotte Haley, they changed the color of the ribbon from peach to pink, and thus the pink ribbon was born. Many teenagers have family going through breast cancer. We got to sit down with a breast cancer survivor to see what you can do to help. If you have a family member diagnosed with cancer and, and you're a, a young person, a teenager, or even younger, um, I think the best thing that you can do to help is just continue to be yourself and to live your life the way you want to. Go to school, make good grades, you know, study, take some of the, 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 the pressure of the nagging that moms have to do. Have you done your homework? Have you cleaned your room? Maybe take some of that pressure off by just go ahead and just doing it. Um, and then just be in there for your parent um, or for whoever may have gotten the cancer, be there for them. And I think that's all you need to do. Just continue to live, live your life the best that you can. And that's going to help out your parent. Breast cancer is a disease that affects many people's lives. Support them by wearing pink in the month of October. Remember, awareness is key. Jessica Gray, TSC News.